So, you know, think about it. what's the holy grail between somebody taking action or not? It's one word, certainty. When somebody is absolutely certain, they, you know, the common word is believe, right? But, you know, you can believe at a general level or you can believe with certain. When you're absolutely certain that if I do this, it's going to get that result and that result's going to change my life, you'll do it. When you think it absolutely is not going to work, you're never going to do it. The middle no man's land of maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, that's the piece that kills people, right? So if it's a must for you, you got to make it work, right? In our case, right? That's an example. If it's not a must for you and you're not sure, you don't know what to do. So I, years ago, I'd look around and say, okay, how do people get themselves to follow through they haven't been following through? What's the difference? And I started interviewing hundreds of people, literally, and eventually thousands, because I had thousands of my events. So I'd ask the group to give me their feedback. And I came up with this model. It's like the holy grail of belief or the holy grail of momentum. It's like the difference between what makes the rich get richer and the poor get poor, right? And the difference we all know is mindset, but like, how's that built? So this is what I did. I created stupid little four little boxes, and I'll scribble it here for you. You think about the first thing that determines whether you can do something or not, and I put that in this first box at the top here on the left side, and it's potential. Like, what's the potential of a human being? Like, when you guys started, you proved something no one had done in history. You ran the four-minute mile, right? For golly knows how many centuries, they're trying to run a four-minute mile. Roger Bannister does it. How did he do it? Do you remember? You did it in this industry, right? You made a million bucks in a day. No one had ever done that in history, right? After you did it, a bunch of other guys are doing it because it became possible. Roger Bannister didn't just go physically practice. He made a shift in his head. He practiced in his head because he could never achieve it physically, so he had a change in his head first so that the result became certain enough he believed it, and then his body got him through. After Roger Bannister ran that four-minute mile, within two years, 37 people ran a four-minute mile. Wow. when no one in history had ever done it. Now, here's how it works. The potential for anybody getting your product is extraordinary. They can do what you've done as much, more or less. They can do whatever they want to do. The potential's there. The market's proven that. Whether or not they tap into that potential has a lot to do with what action they take, which is the question you came to me with, right? Like, you know, God, they all have potential, but they're not taking action. And we all know that the action they take is going to determine the results they get. That's pretty obvious. So most people have a belief about what their real potential is no matter what you tell them. And that affects how much action they take. And of course that affects the result. And then ironically, that result reinforces their belief. And then that belief affects it. So I'll give you an example. Let's say a person has unlimited potential, we all agree. But they take little action, little results. Why? Because they have to start with a problem with their belief. They don't believe it's really going to happen for me. Maybe for Frank Kearns because he's got the cool hair and stuff. Or maybe it's for you because you're so driven, but it's not me. Maybe Tony Robbins because he's afraid he's got these big teeth. Whatever their thought process is, right? They got this thing, right? But what happens is if you believe that there's very little potential, how much action are you going to take? Nothing. Nothing. Little. And when you take little potential with a little action, what kind of results do you get? Lousy little results. And when you get little results, what does that do to your belief? You go, see, I told you this was a waste of time. Sold you this wouldn't work. And then what happens? You tap even less potential. You take even less action. You get even worse results, and your belief gets even weaker. And this sucker feeds on itself until you are in a downward spiral. It's poisonous. It's poisonous, and it's self-fulfilling. Now, what if something could happen that could come along and fill you with a sense of absolute certainty? Not like, I believe, but mean, well, you know. In you guys' case, mine as well, we knew because we had to, because we burned the boats. There was no other option. We had to find a way. We'd had, we weren't going to live that way. We all did it in different ways and for different reasons, but in essence, that was it. If you get yourself in a state of certainty that this is going to work, I'm going to find a way, and if this doesn't work, I will make the way, then you tap a lot more potential. And when you're certain in your potential, you take massive action. And when you take massive action, you really believe in something, you get great results. When you get great results, your brain goes, see, I told you I was a stud. I told you this thing would work out. Now you're even stronger. You tap more potential, take greater action, greater results. That's how you went from 300 bucks in a week to 2,500 in five days to 100,000 in a month to a million bucks in a day. Same thing with you. And we get momentum. That's why the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Now, some people go out and they go, well, I'm going to take a bunch of action. All right, I'm going to open this product. I'm going to try it. And they'll say to you, I even did it. But it's like a salesman who goes and knocks on the door and he knocks on 100 doors and says, you don't want one of these, do you? Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> and even if he doesn't say it verbally, his face says it because he doesn't believe it's going to work. So his voice, his body, the execution is so weak. Maybe if he talks to 100 people, somebody's going to buy out of pity. <laughs> they don't want his kids to starve, right? But he's not going to get the result. So the core difference in people is how do you produce certainty when the world isn't giving it to you?
you go out and you try and you try in your case, your hundred thousand in debt, and nothing's working. How do you keep yourself going? The way you did it, the way I did it, the way you're doing it, we may not have done it consciously, is we didn't change our potential. That was there. And it wasn't even taking more action. Taking more action with a belief it's not going to work, it's not going to change anything. We got results in our head that made us feel certain as if it had already happened. True or false for you? True. Right? So give me an example so people know I'm not just making this crap up. Well, I mean, just like when I had nothing. I already knew I was driving like Ferraris and Porsches and stuff because I always wanted those cars. I right. al already knew I was going to have them. It was inevitable. Right. I inevitably, you know, that was just my inevitable outcome. But how did you do that? Did you have a ritual? Did you think about it regularly? Was it one time you thought about it or was it something you had an obsession towards? I had an obsession towards it. I mean, yeah. I used to go, I wor used to work at a video store, which was the last job I ever had in my life. Thank God. And uh, I used to go to, to work almost every day and I used to bring two magazines with me to read on my breaks. Entrepreneur magazine just to read about business and everything yeah. else to read about what other people are doing look for role models And I used to carry an auto trader with me and wow. I used to look at Porsches that were for sale yeah. And people always used to ask me. What are you doing with that auto trader magazine? I'm like, well, I'm just picking out the Porsche that I'm gonna buy right when I'm which probably got you a lot of crap <laughs> I, I, I did I, people made fun of me. I, sure. I actually had a boss at that job tell me, you know you really shouldn't do that to yourself John because it's, it's very, very likely that that is never going to happen. That it's very likely that you, you're never going to have that car. Yeah. That's, that's the kind of belief he was trying to put in my head. And I was like, no, you don't realize that it's, it's inevitable right. that I will drive here at sometime in the near future with that car when I'm not working for you right. and drop movies off for you to put back on the shelf. And that actually happened. And it was one of the most oh, fulfilling kidding. days of my entire life. And the great thing was when I pulled up in this car, I was, well, you know, I was in my mid-20s. Yeah. A car that most mid-20s. What know, kind of people, car was it? It was a Porsche 911 Turbo. It was sure. a convertible and everything. Sure. It was a beautiful car. It was one I, one I, yeah, when I always dreamed of having. But, you know, for a few years, it, I always circled the ads of which ones I was going to buy. Well, when I finally got it and I pulled up at the store, you know, I had all these people, some people that were still working at the $7 an hour job were there years after I left. And I'll never forget this, even the boss and stuff, and, and the reaction of the people was like, wow, that is awesome. Yeah. Is that your dad's car? <laughs> and all I said to them was, not exactly. Good for and you. I just smiled and just left. But it was, you know, I just, I, I, it's the weirdest thing, but I just knew it was going to happen. But you knew it because I you conditioned did, myself you to did, You did it over and over again. Was, yeah. When I was in high school, I was not a popular kid, but I was passionate and intense, and I'll never forget. Some people, give, some particular girls gave me some crap, and a guy too. And I wrote in their journals or their, you know, their annual yearbook at the end, I wrote, you know, someday I said, you treated me like hell. Someday I'll be rich and famous and you'll be an effing truck driver and you'll be sitting there. I'll be with my rich, I'll be be with this beautiful woman in my life, rich, and you'll be watching me on television thinking, you wish you would have treated me better. I actually wrote this shit in people's <laughs> annuals because I went to a 10 year high school reunion <laughs> when the people showed me That's this great. stuff, right? But it's like, I burned the bridges, baby. I was like, there, this is how it's going to be. So I'll give you a perfect example of this. You know, they did studies, many have been done at this element, where they want to see how much does the mind affect performance. So they take basketball. And I've worked with a lot of NBA players and turned them around. And one of the problems many of them have is they'll choke on the free throw line. You know, well, everybody knows in that case, if you normally shoot really well and now you're not, something's interfering. Something's getting in front of your state. Some uncertainty, right? Obviously. So they take a group and say, we're going to make them better. How do you make somebody better who's got this mental block? So they take a group of guys, and they're going to do free throws, and they do one group where they just practice for six weeks. Totally intense practice, and I forget the number of free throws, but they got to do this many free throws every day. Take a second group, and they have them not practice at all. Obvious. And they take a third group, and they don't let them touch a basketball. All they do is have them practice in their mind, but the key is, it's not practice makes perfect. It's perfect practice makes perfect, as corny as that sounds. So these guys see themselves making the shot every single time, conditioning their mind and body that it's perfect every time. They're not interrupted by a reality that would screw with them. So at the end of six weeks, they tally it up, and now they give them a test to see who has the highest free throw percentage you know, success. What do you guess it's going to be? Well, the obvious person says, obviously, it's not the guys that didn't practice, but which one is it, the mind or is it the ones that actually practice? I'm assuming the mind. Yeah, you would assume it because it's true. Right. You intuitively know the truth that practicing is not enough. It's getting yourself so certain so many times that now when you go to do it, there's no hesitancy and you execute. It's having that absolute certainty.
that makes you tap your full potential, take massive action, get massive results, be reinforced to have even stronger belief. This is what makes somebody a star at anything. It's like Jack Nicholas, the golfer. He yes. visualized every shot and where it was going, landing right where he wanted it before he ever hit it. Every single time. And what do every most golfers single do? Time. They just take a practice swing and they kind of hope for the best and point in the right direction and hit it. And some of them, if they've had some bad hits, what are they really focusing on? You know, what I don't want to do. Exactly. And that's the same thing here. So I'll show you a little stupid little.